قل هذه سبيلي أدعو إلى الله على بصيرة أنا ومن اتبعني وسبحان الله وما أنا من المشركين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Dear brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to this new episode of Ask Zad coming to you live every Sunday at 4 o'clock here in Mecca region Our first caller is Brother Hamza from Bosnia Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Shaykh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you doing, Shaykh? Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Alhamdulillah. Uh, so, Shaykh, my question is about wiping over socks. We know that a resident can wipe for 24 hours. So, sometimes it happens that I'm about to take wudu and I have no clue when my first wiping was. Let's say, for example, it is Isha time right now and I'm taking wudu. And I can't remember whether my first wiping was in Maghrib or Isha time yesterday. What should I do in this case? Would it be allowed to wipe over my socks one more time because I have no evidence that I exceeded 24 hours? Or do I have to take off my socks and wash my feet normally to play safe? Barakallah fikum. Oh, fikum barakallah. It is, as mentioned in the hadith, wiping for a resident for a whole day and a whole night, which is 24 hours. Which means that if you're not certain, because this is not the default, wiping is an exemption or is a, a concession, let's say, from Allah Azza wa Jal. Therefore, it's not the default. So if you're doubtful whether it's Maghrib or Isha, and it's Isha time, take your socks off and wash your feet because you cannot exceed the time limit set by the Prophet ﷺ, which is 24 hours. Hence, if you're doubtful whether it's 24 or more, no, you have to take it off and wash your feet, and Allah knows best. Farooq from Pakistan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So, so I have read from a medical research paper that prostatic or pre ejaculatory fluid, which is najis mukhafsafa, gets released before the man emits semen, which is tahir. So, does this mean that every time we have red creams or emits semen, we must wash it or the clothes that it got that it got on, because it might be mixed with madhi? It might be mixed with madhi. This might between two brackets. Is it certainty or doubtful? Farooq? Uh, I, I don't. It's doubtful, I guess. As long as it is doubtful, we do not care what medical researchers say. We apply the Quran and the Sunnah. Now you tell me, didn't Mother Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, tell us in an authentic hadith, that whenever there were traces of semen on the garments of the Prophet والسلام, if it's dry, she would remove it with her nail, and if it is wet, she would wash it off? The answer is yes. So if it's a najasa, removing it with her nail would not have purified it. And she did not have this assumption, which you have, that, oh, it might have been mixed with medhi or precum or prosthetic fluid because medical researchers say so and so and so. This is an Islamic related issue. We don't go to medical researchers or to science we implement the Quran and the Sunnah. And the Quran and the Sunnah tell us that semen is pure and it doesn't tell us whether we have to take it to a laboratory to analyze it 
to see the percentage of Mahdi uh, um, mixed with it. There's nothing like that in Islam. So one should not exaggerate and go overboard with such wiswas and with such ideas and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Amatullah from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu wa rahmatullah. My question is, if someone has a tumor and if he doesn't undergo an operation, he may die, but he is too embarrassed to do so because it's in the private part. Is it obligatory for him to take medical help? If this is certain and that would be a cause of death, definitely he would be sinful. We've said this before that seeking medical help and healing to cure an illness can be 80% successful, 20% not. In this case, a person is obliged to seek medical attention because it is almost certain that he will be cured and not doing this would throw himself in harm's way. And if the cure is not possible and a minute percentage, so they say, okay, the operation is 10% success. Wow, a 90% failure. In this case, don't go for it or don't take the medicine because the percentage is very low, depend on ruqya, depend on dua, and whatever Allah Azza wa brings is good. And it's 50-50, it's up to your preference, whether to take it or not, whether to undergo the operation or not. And it's a difference of opinion among scholars, which is better. As for your case, or for the question you're asking about the tumor, if the doctors say that Yes, this is a normal procedure. And if we remove it, with the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal, the uh, success rate is 80, 90%, maybe 100%. Then it is a must for you to undergo such a procedure and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Jawad from the Emirates. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Alaikum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, I had a question. Uh, one time I was praying in a musalla. I was praying Salat al Isha, and somebody had joined me. I'm a resident uh, where I was praying, and they joined me, and they're a traveler. Uh, I was praying Salat al Isha, but, and they had joined me as Salat al Isha. After the prayer, he asked me, um, he said, um, I, I didn't pray Salat al Maghrib yet. I just joined you, prayed Isha. Now what do I do? My question, I guess, is if I was in this person's uh, shoes, what should, what should he have done? You know what I mean? Should he have joined me praying Salat al Isha and had the niya for Maghrib? Or should he have done what he did, which is pray Isha, and then afterwards pray Maghrib as a traveler? Okay. If you were in his shoes and the size is the same, it is important to pray Maghrib first than Isha, because the order of the prayers is something preset and prescribed by Allah Azza wa Jal. You cannot pray Isha then pray Maghrib unless you've done this out of forgetfulness or out of ignorance. Or in a third case, when the time is so limited that you can't pray that previous prayer that has gone. And for example, a person did not pray Dhuhr, Asr, and Maghrib due to sleeping. And it's about four minutes for Isha. If we tell him to pray Dhuhr and Asr, Maghrib itself would also be missed. He has already missed Dhuhr and Asr. There are four minutes left for Maghrib time to be over. In this case, we tell him pray Maghrib because it can be prayed on time. 
then you make up for the Dhuhr Asr, and then you make up for Isha. Coming back to your question, this person who is a traveler came to the masjid, found the people praying Isha. He's ordered to pray Maghrib, and he can do this in one of two ways. The first way is, if he's entering the Salat from the very beginning, from the first rak'ah, that he prays the first three rak'ahs with the Imam. And when the Imam stands up for his fourth rak'ah of Isha, he remains seated. He doesn't stand up for a fourth rak'ah because this is his last rak'ah in Maghrib. And he waits until the Imam finishes from his fourth rak'ah, does the sujood and the shahud and salutation. And when he offers salam, he offers salam with him. Then he goes and prays Isha on his own. The second format is that when the Imam stands for the fourth rak'ah, this traveler remains seated to finish his tashahud, his salutation, and offer salam and stand up in time to join the Imam in Isha, in the fourth rak'ah of the Imam, which is his first rak'ah of Isha. And when the Imam offers salam, he continues the second and the third to the best of his ability, and Allah Azza wa knows best. Abu Yahya from Saudi. Alaikum as salam wa rahmatullah. Uh, Sheikh, my question is, uh, you know, I'm actually from the UK, not from Saudi Arabia, but um, uh, my wife in the UK many years ago, uh, she went to university and she took, she took a student loan. And um, like, we got married shortly after. And um, she, you know, she's, she, something like she's been a, a mother ever since. And she has no intention or desire or any aim to work. So how do we go about paying this off? And also, related to that are the implications of how she was having a loan, or having a debt rather. So could you explain this, please? What are we supposed to do? Okay, first of all, student loans are prohibited because they are interest-based loans. Now, to my knowledge, in the UK, I think they give you 9,000 pounds per year and they set up a condition saying that if you were to earn less than 20,000 pounds a year, you don't pay the loan back. But if you earn more than that, you're forced to pay the loan back in addition to interest. And if you happen to die or not earn more than 20,000 pounds, you are forgiven by the government. You're exempted. So taking such a loan is haram. Unfortunately, unfortunately, a, a lot of the Muslims had fallen into this major sin, unknowingly most likely, or thinking that this is a form of a grant from the government like the normal benefits they receive. Having said that, if your wife is not earning and she is not going to work and they, she has the concession from the government not to pay it if she doesn't work, she is not obliged to pay it off and uh, Allah knows best. Kondo Kar from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. I hope you are well. Alhamdulillah. And Shaykh, I'm glad that uh, soon your program is coming on teaching us non-Muslims uh, Arabic. I'm waiting for that, inshallah. Inshallah. May Allah make things easy. Uh, yeah. Shaykh, my question is, today when I, am, when I prayed my Maghrib Salah with congregation, in the third Salah, I went to sujood with Imam. But he raised his uh, and then he seated between the two sujood. And I was doing my sujood. And then I said, Allahu Akbar. And that moment, uh, he goes for the second sujood. And then I cast up with him. Will my prayer be valid? This is it, Shaykh. I w hope may Allah you are due. Were you, were you late, deliberately, or he was too fast? Uh, actually, Shaykh, uh, I was reciting my uh, 
subhana rabbi al aqla and uh, before completing my that i raised allahu akbar by saying allahu akbar and he was going that moment you did not say. you did not answer me my friend i said were you too late too slow or was he too fast even the whole congregation were not able to prostrate and say subhana rabbi al aqla once Uh, I think I am too slow. Shik, if you moment. if you are too slow, then you have to offer one rakah after the salam because of your delay. It is mandatory upon a Muslim to follow the imam. You are not allowed to prolong your sujood in uh, uh, prayer with the in congregation by uh, uh, postponing it this much. until the imam moves to the other or the following pillar so you should have uh, added one uh, rak'a more now it is best for you to go and repeat the prayer just to be safe uh, and inshallah there is no sin on you uh, abu abd rahman from italy assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa alaykum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Okay, we know that in this judgment, if a passing good deed is more than the bad deed, through the mercy of Allah, we we'll put it in Jannah. What about the sin, the passing deed, but still the good deed is more than the bad deed? He allowed for this the sin he did or not? I don't. I don't understand your question. I understood that if a person's good deeds are more than his sins, he will be admitted to Jannah. What about if? What? What about the sin he did? Did Allah punish him for that one? Yes. I mean, if he if his good deed is more than the bad deed, but he do some of the sin, did Allah punish him for that one? Wallahi, akhi, I did. I cannot understand your accent, but basically speaking, on the day of judgment. we have a belief that there will come a scale which is a creation of allah to weigh the good deeds and the bad deeds to weigh the individuals and to weigh the record books and this scale has eyes and has a tongue and the default is that whosoever good deeds outweigh his bad deeds the good deeds erase the bad deeds and he's admitted to jannah providing he's a muslim what about if a muslim's bad deeds overweighs the good deeds the norm and the default is that these bad deeds consume the good deeds and he has to be cleansed from his sins in hell fire unless allah's mercy catches him and allah forgives the remaining of his bad deeds and allah's most forgiving most merciful if a non muslim has good deeds regardless of how many good deeds he has because of his disbelief or shirk or associating others with Allah this is the cardinal sin as they say it erases all of his good deeds blocks them and he's admitted straight away to hellfire for eternity and i don't know if this answers your question or not yusuf from bangladesh assalam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Check, uh, if a man wants to get married uh, and he found a good practicing woman and he wants to get married to her but his parents don't give their consent because they want him to marry a woman of their choice uh, who might not be good for his deen so in this case can he disobey his parents and marry without their consent first of all we are ordered in islam to obey our parents and the prophet had said alayhi salam that the father is the middle gate of jannah and he told us that a man must give his good companionship to his mother three times and 
one on the fourth to his father. Now, having said this, it is an obligation upon every Muslim, man or woman, to be dutiful, this, uh, to be respectful and obedient to their parents, and to be patient and tolerant to whatever abuse they may express or show. Now, having said that, a man is obliged to choose the wife of his liking, not to his parents' liking, because he's the one who's going to be married to them or to her, not them. And he is obliged to provide the woman with a separate accommodation where she is not obliged to see his parents or to serve him or his uh, uh, siblings, etc. So this is the basics in Islam. It is not permissible for you to marry someone whom your parents are forcing you to marry if you don't like her, if you don't fancy her, because I do counseling sessions. I've been doing this for a while with the grace of Allah. And I see the amount of problems after marriage from such choices. The guy says, I'm married for five years. It was an arranged marriage. My mom forced me to marry her. I did not like her. I, I was interested in marrying uh, another woman, but they refused. So I accepted because they forced me to do this. They uh, um, mentally blackmailed me. Now I have three children and I can't live with my wife. And I, I just can't look at her. I can't be intimate with her. So the guy is putting a scenario where he leaves no room other than divorce. Now what is the fault of this poor woman to be a single mom with three children? Oh, my mom ordered me. My mom forced me. If you are a mummy's boy, don't get married. If your mom tells you what to do and what not to do, and you're still suckling milk, don't get married until you are grown up. Marriage is a responsibility. You take a woman into this affair, you take care of her. You become her rock. She depends entirely upon you after Allah Azza wa Jal. If you fail to do this, you're sinful at the sight of Allah. Having said that, for you, Yusuf, to get married, we have to look at the circumstances. If you want to marry someone who's righteous and practicing and from a good family, but simply your parents or one of them is not accepting, we have to look at your circumstances. Are you financially independent? Yes, I am. Can you get married without their financial help? Yes, I can. Can you provide a separate accommodation for your wife? No, I can't. Ah, so you want to marry someone whom your parents don't like and bring her to their home? Forget about this. That is a, an actual nightmare for your mom and for this poor girl. So don't even think about it. What to do? Either convince them so that they willingly accept or wait until you can provide a separate accommodation for your wife or compromise and agree to marry this woman, bearing in mind that you're stuck with her forever. So you have to walk the talk and try your level best to please her and to make it happen. And may Allah Azza wa make a way out for all of you. We have a short break. Stay tuned and inshallah, we'll be right back. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today I'm going to talk about the book Interactions of the Greatest Leader. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reminded us through his guidance and example that Islam is complete submission to the will of Allah. For one who submits 
a mere declaration or display of belief will not be taken for success, but his or her heart and soul will certainly be put to test. Allah tested the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam severely in order that he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam becomes an example for his companions to follow. Similarly, he tests the believer to see whether he lives a righteous life in accordance with the instructions and commands set by Allah or lives according to what his desires dictate. Whether the faith he displays is firmly rooted in his heart or is it merely on the surface, he will be tested to see whether he will continue to have faith and love of Allah when in a calamity as he does when in comfort, whether he will continue to remember and worship him if given bounties and comforts of life as he does when he lives a modest life, Allah will undoubtedly test him to see if his faith, trust and love of him is unconditional or is it conditioned upon good health and a comfortable life free from stress and anxiety. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam showed us through his own example that for a righteous Muslim, this life is a testing ground where he will continue to be tested until he meets Allah. For him, tests will be conducted on earth while he lives and not after he dies. He knows that as soon as death arrives and he steps into the next world, his tests are over. There, he only receives the result of his tests and enjoys the fruits of the deeds that he committed during a short span of time called life. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome back. We have Aisha from Japan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, Shaykh, uh, a friend of mine uh, asked me, um, she has a toxic, toxic family, uh, meaning that her father is very abusive towards her mother and he uses offensive language, runs to beat her, slanders her uh, and drinks alcohol, all kind of bad stuff. And it's been continuous for quite some time. It, it's been two decades uh, to be exact. This time her mother uh, decided to leave him and grown up children once and for all and left to other city to grandmothers. The problem is uh, my friend doesn't want to stay with her father too. She's married but didn't play Walima yet because uh, her husband is abroad. And uh, that's why she was living with her parents. Uh, now that her mother no longer there, she doesn't want to stay uh, with her abusive father. And uh, her uh, father is against it. And if he says, like, I will never be pleased, pleased with you if you leave, and you should stay with me until you, the Valima takes place. But my friend doesn't want to stay. Uh, will she be uh, sinful for not listening to her father? This is problematic. Because it's like torn between two lovers. And Imam Ahmed, if I'm not mistaken, or Ibn Taymiyyah, one of the two, was asked, my father tells me to do something while my mother tells me not to do it. So he answered, obey your father and don't disobey your mother. The guy said, duh. How could that be? One says go right, one says go left, and you say obey both of them. He said, this is my answer. Which means it's quite difficult to give an answer to such a situation. You can't compromise one of your eyes. You have two eyes. Okay, choose, right or left. I can't, I need them both. No, no, you have to choose. It's the same thing, your father or your mother. You can't choose. Now, in the, in the case, if your father is intolerable, 
and you fear for your safety or your mental health or your physical uh, safety because he may beat you up, abuse you, anything of that. Yeah, in this case, you can leave and go with your mom. If he is a sweetheart to his children, but he's abusive only to his wife, his relationship with his wife must not affect you and your siblings, his children. They have to remain obedient, uh, dutiful, and respectful. Despite his sins, this is between him and Allah Azza wa Jal. So try to have a balance and walk a very fine thread by being diplomatic with him and telling him that my mom is depressed and I have to be with her. I'll go one week there and one week with you. Try to do something, but at the end of the day, obey your father and don't disobey your mother and Allah knows best. Muhammad from Saudi. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I hope you are doing well, sir. Alhamdulillah. What can I do for you? Sir, if, uh, my question is if someone is admitted in the hospital, maybe he's, uh, they put this drift on them, they cannot get up to make wudu for salah. How, how can they pray in such a, a situation? Okay. Now, let us understand this. Allah says in the Quran, "Inna salata kanat ala al-mu'minina kitaban mawquta." Prayer was prescribed upon the believers at specific times. This is a fixed thing. Nobody argues about it. You have to pray on time. The second thing is that offering wudu, facing the qibla, and covering your awrah are conditions of salat, meaning that before you pray, these conditions must be fulfilled. And if you don't, while being able to, your prayer is invalid. Someone prays without wudu, and he's able to make wudu. His prayer is invalid. Thirdly, if I'm unable to make wudu perfectly or partially and I'm unable to remove impurities from my body, I'm unable, not I'm lazy, no, no I'm unable, I'm unable to face the qibla, I'm bedridden, then we fall under the category where Allah says in the Quran, Fear Allah to the best of your ability. So if I have this drip IV, and you say I'm unable to make wudu, this does not hinder your wudu process. Because if you want to go to the loo, to the toilet, that's pretty easy. You just carry it with you and go. And you can move around. You can go buy some cappuccino and come back. You're not bedridden. Yes, this may impact the way you perfectly wash your arm, but it doesn't stop you. If this is the case, you have to perform normal wudu. And when it comes to the area that has uh, um, things in it that prevents water from breaching, if it is a plaster or a cast, you just wipe over it. You don't wash it. But the rest you do as usual. If you say, no, 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 Sheikh, you got me wrong. I'm unable to leave the bed. It's not only this drip or the IV. So said, okay, let someone help you with a small bucket of water and you can make water on the bed, uh, you can make wudu uh, in your bed. If you say, no, 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 Sheikh, this is not even possible. I have burns, may Allah protect us. All over my body, I can't even touch water, I can't do this. If you are totally unable to use water, 
in this case, make dry evolution, which is a small box with some sand or soil. And you just strike it once, wipe your face, wipe your hands, the palms of your hands, back and front, and that's it, khalas, pray. So, alhamdulillah, Islam is a, a religion of simplicity and ease. There's no hardship. You can't sta a pray standing up, pray sitting down. You can't sit down, pray lying on your side. But never ever skip a prayer and Allah knows best. Abdullah from India. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh, you must have heard about selling your soul to the devil to get rich and famous. Most celebrities are accused for selling their soul to the devil. My question is, is it really possible to sell a soul to the devil or to the jinn? Is there anything such as this? Thank you. I haven't seen uh, an auction yet or the, um, the souk or the market where you can go and sell your soul to the devil. And even if you sell your soul to the devil, as they say, this doesn't guarantee you to be a celebrity or a rich man. How many non-Muslims are there in, in, in this world? They say eight. Six, that is the total population is eight. Two billions are Muslims. Six billions are non-Muslims. Of these six billions, how many of them had sold their soul to the devil? A lot. How many of them got rich and famous? You cannot mention that. It's very negligible. So this is not a done deal. The risk is only in Allah's hands and not in the devil's hands. And Allah, the Razzaq, is the one who gives whenever he wills. So he may give those who have tried their best to go against him and to do mischief and to do evil things and sell their souls literally to the devil, Allah may give them. But Allah may deprive many of them. And both will be entering hell for eternity on the day of judgment. So it's up to Allah's will. The devil has nothing to do with it. The devil is just a caller. He calls people. He has no control over them. It's the mistake of those who respond and answer him. So Allah told us in many parts of the Quran, whomever wants this dunya, wants fame, wants uh, uh, wealth, Allah may give it to whomever he wishes. But on the day of judgment, he has nothing to avail, nothing to benefit from. He'll be ending up in hell. Allah has given us this warning. So there is no such thing as selling your soul to the devil. There is going against Allah's commands and sharia. And at the end of the day, it's in Allah's hands whether to give this person some risk, some sustenance in this world so that he would tempt others to follow. And then it would be proven who is doing well and who is doing evil things. Look at what's happening around us in the world. So much fitna, so much evil, so much vice. And lots of the Muslims are diving heads first in such munkarat, in such haram. Why? Because it's a test from Allah. لِيَمِيزَ الْخَبِيثَ مِنَ الطَّيِّبِ So that Allah would segregate between evil and good. So now, we're where we stand, we can identify those who are righteous, those who are practicing, those who are real Muslims, from those who are hypocrites, who are openly sinning, who want haram to spread all over the place. It's obvious, we can see that with the grace of Allah, and may Allah protect us all. Chaudhry from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Salam to Allah. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. I watched your videos about dealing with waswasa regarding impurities, but I have a specific question. 
In our university in the washroom, I use the hand shower to spray water on the toilet seat. The hand shower has a leak for which water drips from the shower to the floor, which is usually wet. Sometimes this dripping water, sometimes this dripping causes water to fall on my shoes and maybe the spraying of water causes water to get on my hands. I can't see any visible impurity on the toilet seat or floor. So since this is the toilet, am I supposed to take the water that got on me as Najasa? No. Jazakallahu khairan. No, you should not. Because as you have said, maybe there is a najasa on the ground. Maybe doesn't work in Islam, especially for those who have wiswas, who have uh, uh, OCD. So everything is pure by default until proven otherwise. And hence, the water in the toilet floor is pure until proven otherwise. Yeah, but there is a possibility that there is najasa, there is urine, there is impurity, there is this. There is a possibility. But it's not a real thing. It's not certainty. Yes, Sheikh, but there is a possibility. It might be. I said, okay, yes, your father might not be your biological father. They might have adopted you. Do you have a DNA test? No, Sheikh. Were you there when you were born? No, I was too little. I could not see anything. So how do you know that your father is your father? I know, Sheikh. Subhanallah. So the issue of maybe can destroy your life. Maybe this mug is najis. Maybe the water they made the green tea with is impure or it is from sewer water mixed without them knowing. Maybe there are this, maybe they are that. I would refrain from wearing anything because maybe one of my grandchildren touched it with soiled hand. I cannot pray in the masjid. I cannot lead prayers and... This is not Islam. Islam is a religion of ease and simplicity. Everything is pure till proven otherwise. And this is what you should uh, uh, implement in your life. Yusuf from the UK. Yusuf. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh, I just wanted to ask you about a woman who wants to perform Umrah. She's made, she's made the intention. When she arrives in Mecca, she realizes that she was, she's on a, her period. She, she has a, the menses. Um, so what can she do and what can she not do in Mecca, basically? And is she going to get the reward of Umrah? Okay. First of all, a woman who comes to perform Umrah, she assumes her ihram, the intention is in the heart while flying to Jeddah about 25 to 35 minutes before landing. Usually the captain announces or the flight attendant that we are approaching the Ihram zone for those who are interested in making Umrah. She says, لَبَّيْكَ اللَّهُمَّ umrah," and intends that she is now a muhrim. So if someone says, here is a nail clipper to uh, clip your nails. She says, I'm in the state of Ihram. Okay, here's some perfume. I'm in the state of Ihram. That's it. She's a muhrim. If she reaches Mecca and before she attempts to perform her Umrah, she gets her menses. She's obliged not to go and enter the masjid. What to do? She has to wait until she's pure. Okay, alhamdulillah, she has a visa of two weeks and she's planning to stay for two weeks in Mecca and Medina. So she will be pure before that time. In this case, she remains in her state of ihram. She goes to the restaurant, have breakfast, lunch, dinner, brunches, uh, go to the executive lounge and drink coffee and tea, no problem. But she is prohibited and she's restricted from doing anything of the uh, uh, things prohibited in ihram, such as wearing perfume, such as wearing the niqab, wearing gloves, such as cutting her hair, clipping her nails, etc. After she is pure, she makes her ghusl and she goes to make her umrah. Okay, Sheikh, what happens if she's bound to fly before her purity? In this case, 
at the last moment, she may ensure that nothing is leaking and she goes to perform her tawaf and sa'i for Umrah due to necessity and then she can fly back home. Now, all of this could have been avoided if while flying to Jeddah, before she assumed her ihram, knowing that she may get her period today or tomorrow or day after, she says, لَبَّيْكَ اللَّهُمَّ عُمْرَةً فَإِنْ حَبَسَنِي حَابِسْ فَمَحِلِّي حَيْثُ حَبَسْتَنِي Oh Allah, I intend to have this Umrah, but in case there's something blocking me from continuing or completing my ritual, then I may reject my ihram and become halal as I was before this, due to this le legitimate reason of being blocked, unable to continue my umrah. And if this happens, the moment she gets her menses, she can wear her normal clothes and she could do whatever she wants to do uh, as a normal person, not as a person in ihram. As per your question, what can she do? She could do everything she wants to do. She cannot pray, she cannot fast, she cannot have intimacy with her spouse, and she cannot enter the masjid. Other than that, the sky is the limit. Rayan from Belgium. Rayan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, my question is, uh, so I have a computer and I have two monitors for my computer. So I have two screens. My brother, he has only one. And he would like to get one just like the one I'm using. One of the two I'm using is very good and he would like to get the exact one. So he's asking me if I can give it to him and I do want to give it to him. But the problem is he... Uh, pretty much only plays video games on it. And I do not like what he's playing because it's not al-halal and it takes a lot of time. So my question is, if I just give it to him or I sell it to him and knowing that if I do not, he will buy an exact one like the one I am using, but he will just buy it um, from somebody else or somebody else is going to give it to him. Is it halal for me to give it to him, even though I know he will most likely 90% of what he's doing is not halal? or video games, and Jazakallah Khairan. Well, Jazak, if you know for certain that he'll, he's going to use it entirely for haram, then you must not assist him on haram. But if you know that maybe 50% is haram, 50% is halal, he may use it for halal things, to um, trade, to study, or, some, uh, or the likes, but of course there is an element of him using it in haram, there's no problem in selling it or in giving it to him, and Allah knows best. Uh, Zaim from India. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. How are you, Sheikh? Alhamdulillah. Okay. So, Sheikh, um, on YouTube, how to know that which scholars are reliable and not? Uh, for example, those scholars are by who don't open up openly on the issues of Akida or exposing the people of innovations. So we should avoid taking knowledge from them or uh, what is the ruling or of taking knowledge from them. Because uh, the country where I reside, the guys of Harul uh, Hadith says the same, that uh, the people who don't expose the people of innovation, we should not take knowledge from them. So please help me. Wallahi, this is... Your, your voice is not clear, but from what I understand is that you must not take knowledge from people of innovation because you don't know when they will put poison in the sweets that they present to you. So people of innovation, people of corrupt aqidah, you have to avoid. Now how to know them is by knowing your religion. So if you follow the Quran and the Sunnah with the understanding of the favorite three generations and follow the authentic, reliable scholars like Sheikh Ibn Baz, Ibn Uthameen, Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Al-Qayyim and the likes, then you are in safe hands and you can easily segregate and differentiate between good scholars and bad scholars. Scholars who dedicate their time in or on YouTube 
refuting others. And this is a trend that started maybe 20 years, 30 years ago. And with the social media platforms, it's, it has been increasing. So I want to be famous. I pick up someone who's famous and I slander him and I uh, um, dissect him in front of everybody. And he said this and in minute two, uh, uh, second 40, he said that and this is outrageous. And, and I laugh of them and I ridicule them and I make fun of them. Such people are to be avoided, Akhi. This is not ilm. You are learning from them. This is mocking people. The Jews said to Moses when he said to them, Allah ordered you to slaughter a cow. They said, Atatakhiduna huzwa? Are you making fun of us? He said, A'udhu billahi an akuna min al I seek refuge in Allah to be among the ignorant, those who make fun of others like that. So avoid these people. Stick to the real scholars. Don't look at fame. Don't look at the popularity. Don't look at the many times of viewers. How many views does this clip have? Look at the authenticity of the knowledge, of the moral conduct of the person giving it to you, of his akhlaq, of, of his ilm. And it has to comply with the Quran and the Sunnah with the understanding of the, of, of the Salaf. It has to comply with our real scholars of Islam who had passed away in peace before all these uh, 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 calamities appeared. Then you will be safe, insha'Allah, Azza wa Jal. Ayan from Pakistan. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you doing, Sheikh? Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. So, Sheikh, in our country, Pakistan, many people recite Arabic just like Urdu because it has the same characters as Arabic. So, since I have started to uh, try to recite the Tajweed right in Salah, uh, I am not able to uh, recite it in the moderate uh, volume and speed. Either I uh, recite it a bit loud or I recite it real slow. So, what should I do in this case? Akhi, they say practice makes perfect. Tajweed is not mandatory in your recitation of the Quran or in your Salat. So you don't have to have al-mad al-wajib in was-sama. You don't have to have qalqala wa tariqa. If you say was-sama wa tariq, that does the job. And your recitation is valid. Your prayer is valid. However, the more you perfect your recitation for the sake of Allah and not to please others and not to impress others, then you are rewarded for that bi'idhnillahi azza wa jal. And practice makes perfect with the grace of Allah. So the more you repeat and repeat and repeat, the more you listen to a good reciter and recite with him, you will find that you have perfected it with the grace of Allah in no time. This is all the time we have until we meet next Saturday between Maghrib and Isha here in Makkah region. I'll leave you fi imanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <laughs> على بصيرة أنا ومن اتبعني وسبحان الله وما أنا من المشركين